Welcome to this compressor training. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and I'm really excited to talk about this topic because I, I do it in a lot of my programs, but I know need to get more information out there about why it's so important to keep your compressor cool. And with these new refrigerants coming out, they are starting to go back to the way R22 was. So if you worked on any low temp R22 systems, you would have some sort of cooling on those compressors because with that high compression ratio, R22 runs really hot. I don't know how many times I went into uh, a rack room and I looked at the sight glass on the low temp R22 rack and they're just dark brown or black sometimes right it definitely need an oil change or over the years those sight glasses just turn brown even if you change oil so sometimes you should take off those sight glasses when you're doing an oil change i know you don't always have a lot of time and clean them off you need a new gasket and stuff but it's important to do that because you want to see what the oil really looks like okay and what you really want to understand now is that we went through a phase where we went into hfc's like a 404 507 and those refrigerants didn't run as hot you may have got away or just add it or and manufacturers just put them on sometimes um head cooling fans so just blow air down over the compressor so the compressor is a refrigerant cool compressor but also has air blowing on it now we're back into it because we can't use 404 anymore you can't build any new system this was for a long time now but now we're into 448 449 407 a and c and these refrigerants run hotter they don't run as hot as r22 but i'm seeing i've seen it multiple times now where retrofits happen and compressor fails be, because the the people doing the ref, retrofit have not been taught or or been have an understanding that you need to add potentially some sort of cooling to those compressors so what we're going to dive into today we're going to talk about compressor envelopes this is something that is so important i got a video i did with a, a friend of mine peter from copeland europe it's a good good video where he dives into this the software if so if you're from europe or i believe asia may use the same same software it's called copeland select eight here in North America, it's called Product Selection Software or Copeland Mobile. And we're going to dive into a few of the, that. If you're using the Bitzer software, it, that's a global software. So you only use the one, need the one software. Same with the Dorin or uh, Bach or Carwin, which is the Carlisle uh, um, compressor software. So there's a lot of different softwares out. I'm probably going to just talk uh, today about the Copeland stuff and the Bitzer stuff, give you kind of an idea, because that's kind of the biggest market at this point here in North America. But if you ever have, if you have questions, put it in the chat so I can bring that stuff up because this is very, very important. Making sure that you're keeping your compressor in the right uh, area, in the right zone. Okay, so it doesn't fail. We're gonna get into, we'll talk about demand cooling. I got a video that I'm gonna show you from a guy, the YouTube channel is called Refrigerant Confidential. Check the check him out, does some great videos, but we're gonna watch one of his demand cooling videos. If you haven't seen it before, or if you did, put your thumbs up, but if you haven't seen it before, or you're listening on the podcast, check out this video uh, on demand cooling. He does a great job. This is why I'm gonna show you some of it today. Uh, we're gonna get into what refrigerant injection is what's a little bit of difference between refrigerant injection demand cooling dtcs and electronic valves we'll talk a little bit about that and then how really liquid injection works because there's a there is a bit of confusion out there between vapor injection liquid injection you'll see a lot of this on copeland scrolls definitely their zf or zf models and it's important to understand those DTC valves and their uh, discharge temperature control valves who are made by a few different people. I know Copeland used to use uh, Alco and I believe in Europe they still use Alco here in North America. I believe now they use Parker and I'm going to show you where to find those different manuals 
if you get in a situation where you don't have or you don't have that right part, there are potential options out there if your wholesaler doesn't have that specific one you're looking for. Um, but it's always best to get that original component. Uh, but we do need to get our customers up and running. So the first thing we want to talk about because is overheat and compression ratio. Compression ratio is what causes the most failures for overheat. High compression ratio. What, how do we how do you test compression ratio? What is it? Because you know, this is important. You need to understand as a technician in the field, I didn't check compression ratio. I've, I think in school I learned about it a little bit and they, they told us how to do it. But I didn't know how vitally important compression ratio was or pressure ratio. You may say pressure ratio, compression ratio. Uh, lots of people use different terms, but compression ratio. Absolute high over low PSI. Great, great job. So it's your absolute discharge over your absolute suction. So pretty straightforward. So how do we get absolute? So we need to add absolute pressure. So atmospheric pressure to our either bar or PSI. So thank you very much. So it's 14, I believe it's 14.7. I use 15 to round it off to make it very easy for me. So if you get your gauges on your system, and you get your discharge pressure. This example here, if you're looking at it, it, is 275 PSI plus, I put approximately 15 PSI, which equals 290 PSIA. So we're an absolute. Next step is your suction pressure. So you have your gauges on your suction or you got a transducer on your suction and you're reading on your manifold set and 55 PSIG plus approximately 15 PSI, because it's an easy calculation. And then that equals to 70 PSIA. And when you do the calculation, that equals 4.1 to one compression ratio. So different compressors, different designs, high temp, medium temp, and low temp are gonna have different compression ratios. High temp is gonna have a, a really small compression ratio. Low temp is gonna have a really big compression ratio. That's why you can't take a high pressure or a high temperature compressor and just throw it in easily into a low temp. There are certain compressors that can go in the full range, but if we get into like semi-hermetics, you, you can't just take them and change them because they're designed differently to handle these different pressure ratios. Same with scrolls. You can't just take a, a, a air conditioning scroll and put it into a low temp system because they're not designed or they're, they're manufactured differently and let's do it for our, our metric unit so we get 19 bar you add a add approximately one bar then you do the calculation so if it's 19 bar plus approximately one you get 20 bar a then you got four bar plus one bar equals five bar so you do the calculation again that get the atmosphere so 20 divided by 4 is 4.1 compression ratio so you want to get this compression ratio and then you want to do that calculation it, am i have a really high compression ratio or a really low as a technician this is important to understand and i didn't use this in the field because i didn't know but it's important if it's too high a lot of work a lot of heat if it's too low it's also an issue because you could potentially not, those valves aren't going to open properly. And we're going to talk about it in a second. You could break them. You'd be like, wow, why did the valve break? Well, maybe it's because it was rattling or it was vibrating and it caused it to break. So one of the big things is, is getting into what the operation envelope is. So the operation envelope, all manufacturers have it. This is where it, they designed a compressor to say, okay, we can work in these limits. Most manufacturers, they are, they're, they're good with their numbers. They're usually inside. So you could probably run them a little bit outside their, that, that operation envelope. I don't recommend it, but they, they're conservative. I guess I should say that compressor manufacturers. And what you need to understand is the different operation limits. Because I can run anywhere around this operation envelope on the outside of it. 
because on the if you're looking at this diagram on the the left hand side of this chart you know we got condensing temperature increasing content and then on the bottom you got the evaporating temperature so inside here we'll have different limits and this is important to understand because if you don't know what is happening when you look at your gauges it's going to be very difficult to understand how that compressor is functioning the first one we're going to talk about is right here so we really got a high evaporating temperature but a low condensing temperature so what does this really mean so this is really a low um, pressure ratio so that that compressor gets too low resulting in insufficient force on those reeds so like i said not properly opening and closing on the valve plate this could lead to maybe those valves cracking damaging and that could be an issue so if you're looking at your gauge and you're, you're looking at your pressures and it's that low compression ratio you know you got a low condensing pressure you got a high evaporating or a high suction pressure that could lead to flapping reeds we're not going to spend a lot of time on on uh, that one today because there's a lot of different ones so here's the next section what do you think this would cause you got you got a high um evaporating temperature um but your condensing temperature is okay so you got high evaporating but your temper uh, condensing temperature is okay what could that lead to well so this here now you're you're maxing out that suction temperature what does that do to the compressor right really high evaporator so massive load on that evaporator what does that do for that compressor at this point think about a brand new walk-in box you're starting up it's 85 degrees in the box whatever 72 room temperature 25 celsius in 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 the walk-in box so what's doing that compressor you got maximum maximum uh flow there you got a lot of mass flow and this here puts a lot of pressure on that compressor so you really give you high force on those bearings because you get so much mass flow at this point because if that compressor is a low temp compressor you, when you build a new box and that room is warm you have to pull it down slowly so you don't overload the compressor but you can tell this by looking just looking at your gauges looking at the pressures this is what is important when when you're taking this stuff and and analyzing it taking your time to understand what does this really mean when i'm looking at my gauge set or or what the pressures are temperatures what what does this really mean and that's that's the case oh my walk-in box is 25 celsius okay well okay there's a lot of load on there why is, is that what's causing my compressor to trip off could be next one c right up here so i got maximum really high evaporator temperature as well as really high condensing temperature so what, what will that do to the motor what would that do to the compressor you put a massive amount of load on that motor and so what what does that do you got a massive load on the, that motor again that's gonna that's gonna run you into issues right have you ever put your gauges on outside it's you know 40 celsius 110 fahrenheit inside the box it's 60 degrees really warm fahrenheit i guess i'm gonna try to do my units a little bit better but that's gonna that's gonna put a lot of motor load again on that compressor then we got another one right here really high condensing temperature but you know your evaporator temperature is okay what does that do think about it for a second i got high high condensing temperature my evaporator is running okay what what is that really doing to the system these are the things you really want to think about when you start to think about this and ask be curious about why is what's happening why is this happening because it's easy to tell why it's happening you go out and what caused super high condensing temperature 
if you're thinking, oh, well, you know, it's very hot outside. Uh, the fan motors could be you know, could have, one that could have failed. Could be plug condenser. Lots of these things that it could push that condensing temperature really, really high. Recirculating air. And so what does that really mean? You get to that point, you know, this is, this here is, is something that you need to spend some time on to look at because when this uh, pressure is that high, you're probably going to go off on hopefully what your high pressure control, right? And usually you'll see that you'll come to the site, the compressor's tripped off and it's high pressure. But if you were running like that for a long period of time, you know, that's heating up the compressor high running outside this, this envelope. Then the next one, so I got really low suction pressure, but my condensing temperature is okay. L really low evaporator temperature. Really, my suction super low, but my condenser is high. What does that do? Right? Because I got to stay inside this operation envelope. When I get up to that system and I put my gauges on or I'm taking, checking temperature, I need to understand where I'm at in that envelope. And every compressor is going to have a different one of these. So you'll look at one compressor and it'll have an operation envelope running at these temperatures. You'll have another compressor running at these same operating temperatures, but has a different operating envelope. This is where some of the complexities come in here. And that's why you need to look these up. You need to go to those compressor manufacturers, uh, softwares and find this stuff out it does take some time but when you do this it's going to start to open your eyes up on exactly what's happening in the system so at low evaporator lows the refrigerant mass flow and suction uh, density decrease so when you're think about um and i'm going to show you a performance chart or two but think about when you're running in high temp application ac application do you have high mass flow or low mass flow yeah if you're thinking high mass flow you're right as you start to drop that suction you start to get lower and lower and lower mass flow and this here can you can start to run in to issues with your system with that low mass flow now i'm getting outside that envelope once again you can recognize and see this through your temperatures and pressures and really where, where we're gonna where we're going to talk about is this one here, F. We got really low suction and really high condensing. Re really low suction temperature, evaporator temperature, really high condensing temperature or pressure. And this here is really what causes the most amount of pain to a compressor. <laughs> really high discharge really low suction and this puts a lot of load on on it and so you don't have that cooling coming back um and this is where you will need when you're in this f zone you know high condensing temperature low evaporating uh temperature this is where you're gonna need things like demand cooling water cooled cylinder heads refrigerant injection liquid injection there's lots of different things that you're going to need to investigate in and all these work a little differently some you're going to inject right into the compressor some you're going to inject into the suction line but you need to understand where and why and when and does it need it or does it not need it? Because when you're injecting refrigerant even into the suction line, into the compressor, you're losing efficiency. But we do not want to lose a compressor. This is the key. This is the things that you need to understand and wrap your head around. Because when we get to the operation envelopes of the different compressors, on the right hand on the left hand side you can see this one's a courtesy of copeland emerson is that this zf star k5e 
is a liquid vapor injection compressor. This is the envelope. Depending on the refrigerant will depend if you need a DDC, if you need an EXV liquid injection, and this one here, for an example, it's required. But do you always need it? Do you need just vapor injection? Do you need both vapor and liquid injection? I had, a, I've talked to an end user a few months back and they're like, oh, we're doing a bunch of retrofits. We've been losing compressors all the time now. We don't know why. Because when you use vapor injection, that's for efficiency. Think about a sub cooler on your rack. So you're taking cooling from one rack to the other. You have a plate. And now we're dropping that, that liquid temperature. You get lower liquid temperature, you get more efficient. With the design of the vapor injection compressor, that was uh, what happens there. They inject vapor into the center of the scroll, increases the suction, increases the efficiency of the system of the compressor by like 20%, 25, depending on, on the, the refrigerant and the models and all that stuff. There's lots to it. But it's like you don't need that extra system to do uh, to reduce the liquid temperature. You can do it with these compressors. So what happens, a retrofit happens. And we talked about this earlier. You're going from 404, 507, where that vapor injection was keeping uh, the compressor cool enough. Uh, the, heat, the compressor wasn't uh, running so hot. But retrofits happen. 407A, C, 448, 449 start to retrofit. All of a sudden, they start losing compressors because the retrofit team did not know that they didn't have the liquid injection on there. So what is one thing you can do, just say you do a gas retrofit, what is one check you need to do on all the compressors, any compressors, condensing unit or not, what is the one check you can do to tell if you need refrigerant injection? Think about that for a second. These are low temp applications I'm talking about, but you're gonna to start to see it on heat pumps as well, because heat pumps got massive compression ratio. What's one check? If you're thinking discharge temperature check, you're 100% right. So if that system is running, head temp, yes. If that system is running and you, got, you check the coils, you check the charge, you check the superheat, everything looks great, but you go to your discharge line and you check it and you're running at 300 degrees Fahrenheit, I think that's, I have to check that number out. I need to get better at these conversions because there's lots of people that watch and listen from around the world. But 300 degrees Fahrenheit, what 120 no 150 yeah around 150 celsius it's 302 fahrenheit so if you put your discharge probe six inches down four inches down from the service valve and you're running at 320 that is breaking down that oil losing lubrication so at that point if you know everything else is right and you did a retrofit with that gas something's wrong because if everything's right but you're still running that hot you need some sort of form of cooling. Is it injection you need? Refrigerant injection, demand cooling, liquid injection, depending on who's calling it or who's naming it. And you gotta think about all these different terms. Or do you just need a head cooling fan? Or do you need a water cool jacket? I don't see many of those myself personally, but you may see them a lot of them there. But when you're checking that, you need to understand you need to understand, do I need some more cooling? Why is it not cooling? My return gas is coming back. Uh, what's my return gas temperature coming back at too? That's something you need to check. If we look at the la the right image, this one here is uh, one from uh, Bitzer, from the Bitzer software. And in, you can see, we're gonna dive into it, there's a color application limits. You need to really understand the limits of those compressors because a lot of times, and I've done it, just walked in, checked my pressure, temperature, okay, well, this is what it's running at, this is, this is what it's running at, and never thought any more about it until I started to become curious, until I start, started wanting to know why. Why is this compressor running so up? Why are the compressors running at these pressures? 
you need to understand that you need to be curious why why are they running at these temperatures you got to understand the why not just going up and doing service and throwing your gauges on checking the temperatures understand the why and when you start to understand the why it's going to become more clear for you when you're troubleshooting way more way clearer when you uh, when you're doing that so so we just talked about this do this check check for discharge line temperature check very important copeland states in their synthetic refrigerants they'd like to see 225 below and when you talk about uh bitzer compressors it's 250 four inches away um and that's fahrenheit Fifty, about one twenty Celsius, and then if you do CO two compressors for Bitzer, they state it's two eighty four. So this is why you need to understand the difference in the temperatures, okay, and the application. And you're gonna see more cooling needed in low temp application as well as now in heat pump applications. Because that compression, or once again, that compression ratio is going to can be very, very large. Because if you don't understand what's happening, your compressor is going to potentially start to look like this. Definitely overheat. Definitely an issue. You don't want compressors failing like that. And this is what we're going to talk there's a lot of different overheat prevention but like i said if you checked everything and everything's sorted you just did the gas retrofit and your compressor are still tripping off on discharge line temperature or the oil starting to break down very quickly you got to check that you want to like i said you got to verify everything is that return gas coming back at the temperature that you're you're looking for as well things like that there's lots of lots of things are you overloading it so you want to be aware and that's where it comes into these operation envelopes and that takes us to the different apps that you should be running at yeah i love that kim the maximum discharge temperature depends on the operation conditions so so this is why it's so important to get into these different softwares to look at what it is you can see both in copeland mobile or pss software you can see it in the bits or select soft and we're going to go in through a few of them right now to kind of give you an idea of what you need to look for okay so this is an example of the bits or software you can go check many other videos that i've had on going through the software but this is for the semi-hermetics this is 134a this is a 4ne 20y i just randomly pick some and here's the evaporator temperature 20 uh, 20 f this is uh, so what you want to understand when you're looking at these application limits okay it doesn't matter the the right now at this point the voltage the hertz I'm not looking at that you want to understand the operation the limits because it's going to change depending on the refrigerant you see this section right here it says additional cooling so you want to understand what cooling they need this may just all this may need is a uh, head cooling fan potentially you want to dive in and then you can get into the technical data and you can it'll it'll explain some of it if it loads up here there we go so where is it at here discharge temperature option it says even a fan option right here so right here would be a fan option so for this example i believe and i'll have to double check with uh with bitzer but this one here potentially is just a, if you get in this zone and you run in this zone, you need the fan. Okay, and what you can do, and I'm gonna, I'll do it in a second. We can go to the performance chart right here, and it'll explain what temperature at the specific application, um, and it'll show you. This is what's great about these manufacturers; they're going to tell you really close what that discharge temperature should be. But before that, this is running this compressor with 134A. But now you do a retrofit and you say this compressor, we're going to put 407A in. Now look at this application limit. Now look at this. This totally changed. Same compressor model, but we're putting different gas in it. And I don't know, I've never seen going from 134A to 407A myself personally, but I just wanted to show you this example. 
is that look now not only do you have one cooling line like before i got one two three four different specs that i have to abide by or i'm running outside the operation uh, limit of that compressor and what is what is good why you need to dive into this stuff because look at this one right down here this dotted line here we can say okay this compressor can go all the way down to minus 40 fahrenheit and all the way up to i think it's plus 50 fahrenheit here but if we want to go down to minus 50 i think or maybe it's minus 45 we need to have this ri refrigerant injection with this iq module so for example if you did that retrofit you didn't have a refrigerant injection valve or the the iq module that compressor is going to fail because you're running outside the zone. And this is the key things that you need to understand. Is there a lot to learn about this stuff? For sure. But the first step is realizing that you need this type of cooling for the compressor. The other cool thing, if you go up and you press uh, this little button right here, this does all the data, you hit the play again. And what it does, this bottom number right here at this con condition. So we got uh, 120 Fahrenheit condensing 50 Fahrenheit uh, evaporator. If you go to the bottom number, it says that should be running around 167. Discharge, uh, discharge gas temperature without cooling. So right here. So and you can see how it changes as we go up, as we change, we start to drop that suction temperature you see how it starts to increase that compression ratio is growing our temperature starts to grow in our discharge line temperature because that compression ratio is growing and for anyone who wants to do in metric you can just or an si unit you just click down on the bottom here for si this is important this is why it's so important to get into these softwares next one here emerson uh software copeland mobile i'm just going to go on here you can have product selection software next one right here I just have a compressor already up, a 4DBX. This is a low temp compressor. I'm gonna just pick this one here, just the top one, 407A. Once again, doesn't matter what the refrigerant is. You go to the performance chart. You take a look at this performance chart. And then first of all, I want you to go to a full performance, kind of like we've seen here. So if we go in here, it says blue re area restricted, low superate and or demand cooling. You gotta read this this document right here 287 I have it up right here but you got to dive into the document to get an understanding because I showed you those uh, the in that overheat slide where it said you need a DTC or EV this uh EXV this is saying and stating anytime you're in this blue area you need some sort of cooling if it's uh lower superheat coming back or if you need demand cooling head cooling fan what I want to show you though, you could be running this compressor at 145 or say 77 condensing, or let's go even higher. So 102 Fahrenheit condensing, which is 219 PSI with 407A, uh, and we go across to minus 10, which is 15 PSI, and we're not in that blue zone. So we do not, at this condition, we do not need any type of extra cooling or extra protection for that compressor but all of a sudden if just say something changes uh you get a higher con condensing uh temperature or someone decides to drop the rack pressure from 15 down to 12 or 9 now all of a sudden now, all of a sudden, you need to make sure that you have some sort of extra cooling. So this is why this is so important. The other thing I wanted to show you getting into these performance, and there's a lot to it. I'm just reviewing this quickly, but there's a lot to it. But when you get into back into Copa Mobile, there's this dynamic performance. Click on it. Okay, so this compressor at minus 25 Fahrenheit. 105 Fahrenheit condensing evaporator or a superheat subcooling. Let's not worry about that. You hit calculate. Now look, that at these conditions, this discharge temperature 
is 278. So that means inside that compressor, you're running hot. So if we go back to this document here, minus 25, 105. So minus 25, 105 is right in between here. So this zone right here. So we need some sort of cooling because if you ever heard any of my conversations talking about any compressor manufacturer, the hottest point of a compressor is right at that discharge valve, right when the gas is leaving. When you get four inches or six inches down the discharge line, it's already deep being desuperated, it's already cooling down. So when you're checking there, it's already way hotter in the, in the compressor. So if I'm checking and it's 278, you need some sort of cooling. What I wanted to do is just to show you, let's change this to 120 now. So now all of a sudden I got a dirty condenser, a bit of the dirty condenser or the ambient shot up even more. I go from 120, which was 287 discharge. Look, all of a sudden now I'm running at a 300 degree discharge temperature or 150 C discharge temperature, checking down that, that line. This is, this is how a lot of compressors fail. And if you don't understand how these injection systems work, demand cooling, RI, DTC, you're going to run into potential problems down the road because this is something that you need to check. Okay. And then if we change this one more time, just say we go down to minus 30, because that was minus 25, hit minus 30. Oh, now we're running at 315. Let's see if this compressor can go to minus 40 on these with these conditions. Oh, that specific condition outside the envelope. Please check your inputs. So at minus 40 and 120 with the return gas temperature of 65, superheat of 10, you're running outside that compressor envelope, like I showed you. Let's see if we drop this return gas temperature down to 10. Get a real, really good return gas temperature. We're still outside. Let's see if we change the superheat down to 20. We're still outside that envelope. So we need some sort of cooling. And even at that point, I think we're still out, even outside. If we look here, minus 40, 140. So minus 40, what did we have for 120F? Minus 40, minus 40, 120. So even at this point, so we're saying we're borderline. So this is why you need to dive in into these components, these different manufacturers. And like I said, this is I just showed you Bitzer, I just showed you um, Copeland, but there's also other compressor manufacturers that have the software that you need to look up. You need to take the time and do some research on this stuff. So demand cooling, what is demand cooling? How does it work? Why do we have it? I think we kind of talked about it already. So this is Copeland's model of cooling down their semi-hermetics. They used to have this for their scrolls before liquid injection was a thing or DTC valves. So there used to be demand cooling for scrolls. They don't have that anymore. They don't use that, that's obsolete. Now they're more on um, DTC, EXV uh, with Copeland uh, protection modules or diagnostics, I believe. Copeland diagnostic modules. So the function of this, there's like three, three things that you have on it. You have this controller, you have the injection valve, and then you have our alarm relay. So there's really just three things. You need to go and check out this uh, application engineering built in 1287, and it'll talk about demand cooling. I didn't bring up the, the thing, but uh, there's so much to talk about. Um, and when you get into this manual again, 1287, like I said, all compressor, if you go to Carlisle, they'll have a, a, a manual that talks about their, how to keep their compressor cool. Same with uh, Bach, same with bits or all of them will have that information. You just need to spend the time to look this stuff up. It does take time. It's not super easy to be honest, but over time you will get it. And then you got to read this stuff here. You might look at these graphs and how does this work? So this is 407 uh, A or F. This is a head cooling fan required and core sense discharge protection without demand cooling. So you can get away without uh, demand cooling 
if you're running with a, a maximum a 20F compressor superheat. So if you're running at 15 degrees superheat coming back to the compressor, you potentially can run at these conditions. But if uh, with demand cooling, it shows you the injection line. And I highly recommend you, if you're using low temp, you're running like this, have this. This is just going to... This is going to protect you from the times that uh, maintenance is not being done, something like that in that area. And here it's giving you an idea of the injection line. Okay. Get into the manual. Here is a quick example. I just wanted to show you what you need to look for, what should be, have, uh, should be on the, the system. There's manufacturers that don't put a lot of the stuff that the compressor manufacturers recommend. So Carlisle could recommend something. Like uh, Copeland does here, having a sight glass, having an inline filter, having a solenoid or a shut off valve. Sometimes you don't have that stuff. So you got to deal with it. But you got to understand how it all works, right? So if you don't have it, fine. But understand that here's my liquid line. I got liquid coming from my liquid line going all the way back through a sight glass into this injection valve that's controlled by a controller. And that controller is taking the temperature from inside the head and saying, listen, while we're getting hot, let's open up this uh, solenoid valve and inject into the compressor. And I'm going to just stop sharing for a second and then reshare because I forgot to pick share with sound. Okay, hopefully you can see this again. And this video here, once again, is from Refrigeration Confidential. How about now, can you guys see it? So when you get a service call and your compressor's off, here, remove the covers to check all the safeties when it's open on. Here, the demand cooling, you'll see it's 208 L&M, so it's open. I removed the sensor so it can I can trick it and make it go off on demand cooling. So once again, L and M the safety it's open 208. Some people just reset it and call it a day. Like no, we're good. Watch it for a little bit. But I'm going to show you what to look for when you're off on demand cooling. You got the magnet right here. Sometimes inside of it the magnet's already missing or broke off. So when you try to hit it, reset it, and it's not going off that little magnet is actually missing if it is you can just go down to the store and grab a little abc magnet and that'll work to reset it for now it's not a permanent fix but hey man at least you get you back online so the next thing i do is i look for the temperature probe for the demand cooling module here you can see it's right behind it so the temperature probe when it gets too hot it lets the module know when it's time to shoot liquid into the compressor and when it gets satisfied, when to turn it off. I usually pull them out to check the conditions. Here you can see it's really dirty, and that's going to affect the temperature reading of it. So it might affect it when it's time to shoot liquid in it, or it's getting way hot and it doesn't know because it can't tell from it. So what I would do is I get a little bit of sand cloth and then gently clean the sensor. Not to damage it, but just enough to get it back on. Get all that crud, all that black stuff just off of it and make him brand new shiny again. Here you can see that it pretty much looks almost new and it'll get a better reading and it can react a lot more faster. Here you can see the difference between both of them. Here on the demand cooling, I took it off. I just wanted to show you at the bottom where the sensor connects to. Here is where I would be putting the jumper. You'll see it in a little bit to test my uh, liquid injection solenoid right here, the coil. Demand cooling module is in place. So now we're going to check the liquid injection solenoid. So you remove the sensor. You grab your little jumper, you make it. So right now you can see it's not feeding, it's just out. And you want to test if it's working. So you grab a little jumper, you put it in. And you'll see it energize. So in a little bit, you're going to see the frost just going into the compressor and the liquid. I'm going to leave it in there for a little bit so you can see the difference. It's going to turn pretty much white and frosty right now. So by doing this, I'm verifying that the solenoid is working and it is shooting liquid into the compressor. There you go. Took it off. It's not feeding. So that's good. So let's just say you jumpered it and it's not energized. So next thing you would do is check the voltage, 208. 
and you want to verify that you are getting to the way to the injection coil. So I'm going to turn around, look at the demand module and see the wiring. So here I'm going to pause it for you. The first two are the module power coming in. S would be the liquid injection solenoid, one side of it. You got L and M, which is a safety switch that's in series. Pretty much you got coming from the low to the high, going through the demand cooling module. It goes to the next one. And the last one, A, it's usually wired for an alarm. So now I know blue is one side of my S, so I got to find the other side right now, which would be L2. But right here you can see the conduit going to the injection cylinder coil. And here it's coming from the demand cooling. So that's when you have to kind of just separate the wires, look for them. The power is off by the way, I'm not playing with live wires. So right now I'm just trying to separate the wires to show you in the box. So you have S which is one side of it, L2 is the other one. You can check in the actual module but I just wanted to show you the CAN. So you put your meter on S and L2 and you have 208 then that um, injection should be energized. If it's not and you have 208, then you have a bad one, you're going to have to replace it. And let's just say between S and uh, L2, you get no change. You can't get 208 or anything, then your actual module is bad and you're going to have to replace it. It does happen, the demand cooling module do go bad. Pretty expensive, but they do go bad. One of the last things I check is if I'm actually low on refrigerant. So I'm getting my actual gas from the header that just kind of tees off to the liquid header going to the cases right here. Let me show it to you. So this whole line is feeding every single compressor. It's just tapping into it. So when you're low, you're not going to get a full column of liquid. You might get a little bit of vapor and it's not enough to cool down the compressors. So going back into the checker to show you, we'll check the side glass going in. And it's actually clear, which is kind of rare, but hey, it's clear right now, it's working for us. Just to follow it, it feeds the cases on one side, then taps off and goes to the compressors. So right there you can see that it tees off. So you got the liquid header and then you got the demand cooling header right there. The compressor we're working on, that's the last one in the run, so if anything, that will be the first one to go off in demand cooling. That's when you have to look for a leak, repair it, add the gas, and get it back online. Now to summarize everything, my demand cooling checklist. First thing I do is I check if it's open on the demand cooling. So L and M open, yep, okay, next one. I check the magnet, is it still on there? It's broken, it's on the ground. If it's on the ground, then I can tell it's had a history because people have been resetting it and breaking it. The next thing is I pull out the probe. Is it dirty? Is it not feeding? Do I need to clean it? Is that getting too hot and that's why it went off? That's one thing. Next one is, is a coil on the liquid injection good? That's when you test it with the jumper. You jumper it out, it's feeding. All right, good. On to the next one. Are you getting 208 to the coil? If, it, if you do jumper and it's not feeding, that's when you go again into the can, verify, put your meter on S and L2, you're good there. Is the liquid injection feeding? Now, that's if you put in the jumper and you don't see that white frosty it could be bad those do go bad you might have to replace that as well and the last one is if everything is good I check the rack see if it's low on gas because if you're low on gas you're going to get almost vapor you're not going to get that full column of liquid to cool it down as much as you can that's when you're going to have to leak check find it and repair it top it off and you're good I only do that when it's multiple demand coins off like the three out of the four compressors is off then that's when I really concentrate on the lower refrigerator. And that's my checklist for demand cooling what to check for. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully it gives you a new trick or two. Well, make sure to give uh, Refrigeration Confidential a follow. Super important, but great video, right? Once again, getting into um, yeah, Refrigeration Confidential. Give them a follow. Great video there. One of the things is, is that you want to match that stuff up. So when you talked about L2, you can go into that manual 1287 and check it. L1, L2. 
So here it is in the manual. That's your LL1, L2, and your S. Go match it up. There's your sensor. Here's your M, L, and A. This is what you need to do. You got to take your components and match it up to the, that, that information that you have because it's going to really help you um, understand that component more. Uh, the other thing, there is the sensor right here. So you can take this sensor and check the resistance. So you go into that manual once again, and you take a look at it and match it up. Is this working properly? Is it not working properly? And we're running out of, running out of time here, man. I, I like to talk. <laughs> so so that, that's one way to do it. Well, how else do I do it? Well, you can have the TREV valve, the temperature response expansion valve. So this one here, would you would same thing, you would put it in the, the liquid line, that liquid line would go into the suction line. And as you can see here, this is from Sporland, could be it should be about 12 to 18 inches from the compressor. And then you have install the bulb as close as possible to the compressor, insulate it. Right, you want to make sure you're insulated there. And then this valve will will this Y1037 will inject. So it's important to understand that. I want to pull up a few other manuals to take a look at. So not going to have time to dive into the liquid injection, but here's the manuals here, AE4-1425 and AE4-1383. These are important to dive in because this talks about the DTC sections, when they should be injection, at what temperatures they should be injecting at. Some inject at 250, some inject at 193 Fahrenheit. And then when we go into here, the Sporlin document, the SD-473, it gives you an idea. It even has the part numbers here. Here's the Copeland part. I believe these are the Copeland part numbers right here. But as you can see, 193, 250, different inlet connections. So you want to make sure you get the right one. Uh, and then here's it, how to install them properly. If you go down, this coil spring super important. This O-ring right there is super important. So take the time. Don't just... Try to throw parts on because I've done that before. You run into a world of hurt. Um, and you'll see this on lots of applications, this type of valve here. And there's other types of uh, refrigerant injection valves. What we've seen there from refriger uh, Refrigeration Confidential, that was a, a 3D discus, so a three-cylinder. But when you get into the four and six, they have different, different types of piping. They have different ways to do it. So this would be the European manual. So demand cooling, they talk about like there's a different piping scheme for the injection for the 4M and 6M. So you need to get into these manuals. It's the only way it, that you're going to learn it the quickest. The only way you're going to learn it, if you want to learn it the hard way, do it like me and try to wing it a lot, break a lot of stuff and figure it out on the fly. But if you take the time to learn some of this stuff, promise you it's going to make a difference in your troubleshooting game. I have a compressor masterclass coming up next week and I got a bunch of them, uh, a bunch of them happening. 